Good morning, everybody. Um, in today's lecture, we're going to continue with the topic of energy and transformations. And today, we're going to talk about how chemical energy is converted to mechanical energy in our cells, or rather, in a specialized kind of tissue that does exactly that, which is muscle tissue. So we're going to be talking about uh, muscle contraction, its regulation, its biochemistry. Um, now, when I say that we're transforming some kind of chemical energy, some kind of chemical potential energy into mechanical energy, what, what, is, what, what is the chemical energy that I'm talking about? How is it, how is it stored, this potential energy? Gradient voltage, gradient of what? Like gradient uh, going across and then like high concentration somewhere, low concentration up there. Okay, is, is, okay. Um, potential difference? Potential difference of what or where? Time. Okay, um, so, okay, yeah, some energy is stored in those gradients, you, you're right, but it's not that kind of energy that's converted into mechanical energy. Um, Okay, ATP. What about ATP is what stores the energy? The bonds. Okay. How okay, how far away it is from the equilibrium. That's what makes ATP a source of energy that we can use for something. Okay? It's not in the bonds. It's only how far away we are from the equilibrium. Okay? Bonds can be any kind of bond. If we are far away from the equilibrium, it's going to work exactly the same way. Okay? It's not the bonds. Okay? It's how far we are from the equilibrium or what kind of Gibbs energy we can, we can release uh, if we let the, um, the, the, the current ratio of reactants and products drop down to the equilibrium. Okay? So this is, this is the potential energy that we're going to be converting into uh, mechanical energy in the muscle. Okay, bef before we start talking about uh, the actual contraction and its regulation, uh, let's just very quickly re revise what, kind of, what kinds of muscle we have, and what is the structure of muscle. So, are there different kinds of muscle tissue in, the, um, in our bodies? Yes. Okay, what, what kinds do we have? Okay, we have cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and skeletal muscle. Okay, um, so those are the three types that we're going to be talking about, and they are in some ways they're similar, in some ways they're different. Uh, as you all know, well, you know the, the structure. Um, is there any um, classification that puts two of them into one group? Striated. Okay, striated muscle. Okay, I just wanted to, um, um, to remind you of the, of the term because we're gonna be using that. So we have striated muscle, which, which includes cardiac and skeletal. Okay, very good. Because they have more similarities than smooth muscle, which is quite quite separate. Right. Um, okay, we can be using the structure of those a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to draw it on the board, so that's not a problem. What about the contractile proteins? What are the proteins that are needed for muscle contraction? Well, there are probably loads of them, but... Okay, there's actin and myosin. Are there different kinds of actin and myosin? Okay, there are lots of types of myosin. Okay, what about actin? F and G. What about what is the difference between F and G? Okay, so F actin. Yeah, that's right. It's a polymer of G actin. So those are the fibers of actin that we that we have in not just in our muscles. They have, they're in all sorts of places. And those are the two proteins, so actin and myosin are the ones that uh, are responsible for the actual contraction. The, the type of myosin that we're going to be talking about is type 2 myosin. Okay? There are lots of types, I think there are at least six different types of myosin. And in all types of muscle, the, the myosin that we're talking about is type 2 myosin. Now, uh, myosin as a, as, a, as a protein is, does anyone know what, what the structure of myosin is? Are there any different subunits or something? Yep. Okay, there's heavy chain and there are light chains. Okay, that's, that's a common feature to all types of myosin. Now, in type 2 myosin, uh, the heavy chain has two domains. One is a long tail, which is a coil-coil structure, and there is a globular domain 
that we're going to be talking about quite a lot. That is enzyme activity, it's ATPase activity. Now, so this whole thing in myosin, in myosin 2, is the heavy chain. And the light chains are just associated with the, with the globular, globular head. Okay? Now, myosin 2 actually doesn't look like this. It associates into oligomers. So usually, the, the, well, the, the, the basic building block is that we have two heavy chains intertwined together into, into a dimer. And then these dimers associate to form the thick filament in the, um, in the sarcomere. Okay? So actually, what we see is there's a big thick filament with lots and lots of individual molecules of myosin. Okay? So this is what myosin in our muscles looks like. Now, because the, it would be really tedious if I were to draw all of this, in the, remain, in, in the remaining part of the lecture, I'm just going to draw one molecule of myosin 2. Okay? So I'm just basically going to draw the heavy chain. But be aware that this is what it actually looks like as the whole thing. Okay? And I'll try to remind you every time. It's not just the one coil and one head that does everything. Okay? There's actually a, a, a multitude of them. Yep. Yes. Well, the, the basic building block is a dimer of two, of two heavy chains and, and eight light chains. But then they associate together to form the thick filament. Yep. Uh, the light chain just surrounds the globular head and the rest is the heavy chain? Like they attach the heavy chain? That's right. Yeah, correct. Okay. So the light chains are relatively, hence the name, they're like they're small, small proteins that associate with the, with the head. And they are very important for the regulation of, of contraction, as, we, as we'll see in a minute. Yes? Yes, for light chains. Four? Yep. But if you draw four on one of it, that means on both of them you have eight? That's right. Okay. Let me just get rid of this. Okay, so that's just a revision of the structure. Now, let's talk about the actual contraction cycle. So what happens, how do we transform chemical energy which is stored in the potential of ATP, which is far away from equilibrium, into actual mechanical energy at, a, at, a, at the level of those proteins. So to start with, I'm going to start with the end of the cycle, the end of contraction, okay? in which, and this is obviously just a schematic picture, this is an actin filament, and this is one head of myosin. Okay? Again, be aware that there are lots of them, okay? lots of actin fibers and lots of, lots of myosin, uh, myosin molecules. Okay? So this is the end of contraction. The myosin head is bound to actin. Okay? It is empty, it doesn't contain anything, and that's it. It just sits there. It's a, stable, it's a pretty stable situation. Now, if ATP is present, which most of the time in our muscles, while, while we're still, still alive, it is, this complex of actin and myosin in this, in this configuration can bind ATP, which releases the bond between actin and myosin. Okay? So the first perhaps interesting thing about the contraction cycle is that ATP is actually required to release the contraction, not to cause the contraction, but to release it. Okay? Okay, which might be counterintuitive, uh, but we'll see that actually the, the energy that is stored in ATP is still stored in this thing, but we need ATP to release it. Why is that important? Um, you've probably heard about rigor mort mortis, that when you die, your muscles become stiff, and this is exactly the reason for it. Because once we die, once our muscles start dying, there's not enough ATP to release the contraction of the muscle. Okay? So the muscle basically becomes contracted and there's nothing to release it. Okay? And the reason for that is that ATP is needed for the release of the contraction. Okay? In the end, the muscles obviously relax because the proteins just start to disintegrate and obviously, uh, but this is the reason for, um, for rigor mortis. Right, so in the first step, ATP is bound to the, the myosin head and the bond between actin and myosin is released. Now, 
What happens next? In the next step, I mentioned that myosin is an ATPase, it's an enzyme, so it's capable of catalyzing the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and phosphate. And that's exactly what happens in the next step. So, we still have actin and myosin. Instead of ATP, we'll have ADP and phosphate, which still remain bound, remain bound to, the, um, to the, um, uh, the myosin head. So we have ADP plus PI, which still remains in the bound to myosin. Okay, that's the next step. Okay. In this hydrolysis, you would say, well, some energy should be transformed. In this case, the energy is just, is basically stored in the, as you can see, in the changed conformation of the protein. Okay? So in the hydrolysis, the conformation of the protein of myosin changes so that from an acute angle between the head and the, uh, and the, um, the coil part, it becomes an oblique angle, okay? So the, the head of myosin is basically prepared for contraction, and that's where the energy from the hydrolysis is stored. Does this make sense? Yeah, maybe, not really. Okay, raise your hand if it makes perfect sense. Okay, well, most people, not quite everybody, but we can probably address it afterwards in, in questions. Right, so in this, in this high energy conformation, myosin is basically ready to contract, to cause contraction. But as you can see, it's not actually bound to actin. So something has to happen to allow it to bind to actin. Now, this something, hmm? well, yes, it is calcium, but we're gonna be talking about the regulatory pathways in a minute, okay? So let's just leave that as X, you're right, it's calcium, okay? Uh, but something is needed uh, to allow the, uh, this high energy form of myosin to bind to actin. So in the next step, what we see is that the myosin head binds to actin. We still have ADP plus PI bound to it. And in the next step, the important thing happens. So the conformation of myosin turns back to the original one, to the relaxed one, to the low energy one. But in order for that to happen, phosphate is released from the myosin head. So what we end up with is we're back in the low energy state. ADP is still bound to the myosin head. But since in this, in this step we change the conformation of, of the myosin head, it means that the myosin and actin have actually moved against each other. Okay? Because here we attached myosin to actin and then we changed the conformation of actin. So the two things will have moved against each other. Okay? And this is where the actual part of contraction happens. This is where the energy that was stored in the change conformation here and, and the, the change of conformation was, was, possible, was made possible by the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and phosphate. Here, the energy is transformed into mechanical energy. Okay? Now, in the next step, ADP is released and we get back to the beginning. Okay? To the low energy contracted state. Okay, so this is the contraction cycle of the actin myosin complex. Now, as I said in the beginning, I'm just showing one myosin molecule. In fact, there are lots of them in the, in the thick filament. So actually, while this happens individually for each of the heads, during an actual muscle contraction, what happens is that all those heads actually gradually move along the actin filaments, okay? So this is a cycle for one head, but the whole filament will just keep moving slowly, well slowly, it's actually very quick. quick. So when I do this, billions of myosin, or whatever, millions, hundreds of millions, I don't know, of myosin, of myosin heads will go through this cycle and will slowly move 
along the Acton, Acton um, uh, framework. Does it make sense? Okay, so this is a simple schematic of what happens with one myosin head, but actually there are lots of them. So during one contraction, so this is not one contraction, okay? This is an, a tiny little part of one muscle contraction, okay? Does that make sense, or did I just confuse you? <coughs> Raise your hand if that's clear, okay. Good, any questions about the contraction cycle itself? It's relatively simple, you just have to learn it. Um, yep. It's, is it ever been proven? Well, I don't want to go into the philosophy of proving something, but yeah, this is, this is the consensus. It's, there's a lot of evidence for this, yes. It's not just conjectural, it's, it's actually there, there's experimental evidence for this. Why, are you doubting anything? Or? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it has been, yes. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, um, well, this is what causes actual movement in the muscle, okay? But you could argue that the chemical energy is already converted into mechanical energy here because you changed the conformation of myosin. So I guess it depends which one, which one you pick, okay? But, but the movement is produced here, okay? Any other questions about the, uh, the contraction cycle? Yep. What are they? Are they relaxed or contracted? Which steps? The second and the fourth, I guess. Which is the second and the fourth? This one? Yeah. Okay. So this, this is still a relaxed conformation. Okay. It's a relaxed conformation of myosin and it contains ATP. Okay. Here, it turns by, by ATP hydrolysis, it turns into the high energy. For, huh? High energy, but you still relax. Well, no, okay, we're talking prob about, probably about two different things. One is relaxed muscle, yeah. and the other one is relaxed protein. Uh -huh. Okay, no, so the relaxed protein, pr the protein is relaxed here, here, and here, and here it's in the non-relaxed, in the high energy state. Okay, for the muscle as a whole, um, it's very difficult to say whether it's, well, clearly if, it's in this state, it's not relaxed, okay? So here, whenever, whenever um, myosin is bound to actin, the muscle is probably contracting, okay? But again, the actual macroscopic muscle contraction is a sum of all those individual heads of myosin doing something. Does, does it make sense? <coughs> it's, it's not easy to map this onto what, what you'll see macroscopically. Because it depends, if it is just one myosin head doing this, you won't see any macroscopic contraction. It's too small for that. Okay, when you have a million uh, myosin heads doing that, you will see macroscopic contraction. Okay, right, anything else? So the first step is the high energy state, if you go This one? Yeah. Yeah, that's, the, the protein is in a high energy state, correct. And it's in a high energy state until it releases phosphate when it goes back to the low energy state, which causes the movement. So myosin is the uh, Yeah, yeah, the myosin has ATPase activity, okay? So it, it does cleave, it does hydrolyze ATP to, to ATP and phosphate, okay? Right, so let's now move on to the perhaps more interesting bit which is the actual regulation. And you correctly said that the, the, um, the stimulus for this whole cycle to, to, to be a cycle, not to stop here, is calcium. Now calcium is the stimulus for contraction in all three types of muscle, okay? So calcium as the stimulus is common to all three types of muscle. But how do we get to an increased <laughs> calcium concentration in the cell differs in those different kinds of muscle. And we're gonna talk about that right now. Um, what is approximately, what is the concentration of calcium inside a cell? Approximately. Approximately nanomolar, okay? 10 nanomolar or something like that. What is the concentration of calcium in the extracellular fluid? Approximately. Two millimoles? Yeah, it's about two millimolar, okay? We're talking about concentration, so it's not millimoles, it's millimolar. Yeah? 
So you can see that it's quite a big difference. We have millimolar outside and we have nanomolar inside. Okay? What, what is the difference? How many orders of magnitude is that between nanomolar and millimolar? Six, six orders of magnitude. Okay? Quite a huge difference. Now, in most types of muscle, in order to start this whole cycle, or rather to remove the, the block, which is here, we need to raise the concentration of calcium inside the cell approximately to micromolar levels, okay? So, so two or three orders of magnitude up, okay? Now, how does it work? How does it happen in the different kinds of muscle? Let's first start with skeletal muscle, and because there are lots of similarities between skeletal and cardiac muscle, so we'll use the, uh, the mechanism of skeletal muscle then to explain cardiac muscle. So if we draw schematically a muscle fiber, skeletal muscle fiber, um, what, what, what is this? Okay, it's a sarcoplasmic membrane. What is this? It's the T-tubule. What is this? Yeah, it's, it's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It could be anything, but it's, it's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Uh, what is this? Yeah, it's a mitochondrion. And then we have the, the myofibrils somewhere around there. Okay? We won't really deal too much with that because we've already dealt with that. Okay? So we already know what happens at the level of myofibrils. Now we're interested in the rest of it. All right. What, what is the, the outside stimulus for skeletal muscle contraction? We talked about it in one of those previous lectures. It's acetylcholine. Okay? Acetylcholine is released from the nerve ending at the neuromuscular junction, and acetylcholine binds to its specific receptors. Okay? Now, the kind of, of acetylcholine receptors that are at the neuromuscular junction on the sarcoplasmic, on the sarcoplasmic membrane part of it are actually something that we call ligand gated ion channels and you're going to hear quite a lot about it in the next in, in the next course so I'll just leave it at that but what it means is that when when those receptors are activated by acetylcholine they allow primarily sodium ions to go inside the cell okay what what happens when we open a sodium channel in this case, it's ligand gated. We open a sodium channel on, on the membrane. What happens? Yeah, how, do, how does the membrane potential, potential change? Okay, it becomes more positive. Okay, remember that our normal excitable cell has the, the membrane potential between or around, does anyone know? Minus 80. Minus 60, 70, 80, depending on the tissue. Okay, so it's negative inside. Therefore, if we open a sodium channel, sodium, because of the gradient, will go in and will raise the potential. The potential will become more positive. Okay, it can go all the way to zero. It can actually cross zero. That's not the point now. Okay, so we depolarize the membrane. We increase the membrane potential. Now, raise your hand if this is clear, at least to some extent. Good. Okay, all right. So we depolarize the membrane around our acetylcholine receptor. Now, what happens next? This alone would not be enough to depolarize the whole cell. We need to amplify the signal. We need to amplify the depolarization. And for that, we have a different kind of sodium channel, which is no longer ligand gated, so it's not stimulated by acetylcholine, but it's something, it's, 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 it's voltage gated. Okay, it's a voltage gated ion channel, which means that it's open when the membrane depolarizes around it. Does that make sense? Yeah, good. Okay, so it's a voltage gated uh, sodium channel which further amplifies the, um, uh, the, the depolarization and allows the depolarization to run across the whole skeletal muscle fiber. Okay? Now, we're still not that closer to calcium, so what we need is a calcium channel. And indeed, uh, on the sarcoplasmic membrane, there is a calcium channel, which is a voltage-gated calcium channel, and it's called dihydropyridine receptor. The 
dihydropyridine or DHP. Dihydropyridines are a class of drugs, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit more later. Uh, and that's where the name comes from, because those drugs block these, these receptors, okay? They're called dihydropyridine, that's, that's how it is. The interesting thing is, in skeletal muscle, that even though this is a voltage-gated calcium channel, voltage-dependent calcium channel, it's not really important whether it allows any calcium in or not, it probably doesn't. What it does, when the membrane depolarizes, it changes its conformation. And the change in conformation is physically transduced to another calcium channel, which is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when the voltage goes up, where the, where the potential goes up on the sarcoplasmic membrane, the conformation of the dihydropyridine receptor changes which is then transduced to another calcium receptor, which is on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which opens and allows calcium to go from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm, okay? You know from histology that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a major store of calcium, so there's lots of calcium inside, and this is released into the cytoplasm when this whole thing happens. The re the <coughs> The, the iron channel on the sarcoplasmic reticulum is called ryanodine receptor. And once again, ryanodine is a compound that blocks it. Okay, it's a plant-derived compound that blocks it. Okay, those are just names, but they are relatively important so that we know which, uh, which channel is which. Okay. Okay, you look a bit depressed or something. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I have a question. Um, exactly. Are the DHP and the ion is inside the cell? It's inside the cell. Yeah, so, it's not so this one is on the membrane. No. Sorry? Is, is, is it in sarcolemia or the... Yeah, this one is in the membrane. Okay. This one is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. This one is the cell membranes. And they are physically connected. The two are physically connected together. Yeah. Uh, I didn't catch the so the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the membrane that the transporter releases calcium, but the recept the transporter above that takes in sodium. No, for for our purposes, this doesn't allow any ions to go in. It probably does a little bit, but it's not important. Okay. The important thing: this is a sensor. This is just a sensor of voltage on the on the on the on the sarcoplasmic membrane. Okay. Once the voltage changes. It changes its conformation. It pushes open the other channel, which actually allows calcium out. Now, why do I keep talking about all these details, detailed things? The important bit from this is that for skeletal muscle contraction, we do not need extracellular calcium. Pretty much all the calcium, almost all the calcium, comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in skeletal muscle. Okay. No, you don't. Not in skeletal muscle. Okay? It's different in other, other types of muscle. But in skeletal muscle, you do not need any calcium from the outside in order to cause contraction. All the calcium that we need comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, maybe a little bit from mitochondria, but mostly from sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay? Where is the receptor? It's on the, on the cell membrane. Okay? So DHP, dihydropyridine, is on the cell membrane. Ryanodine is on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and they are connected physically. Okay? Important bit is we do not need extracellular calcium for skeletal muscle contraction. We do in the end. Okay? If, you, if you wanted to contract skeletal muscle for a very, very, very long time, you will probably need some extracellular calcium because some of it leaks, et cetera, et cetera, but mostly you don't. Yep? That's right, due to the changing voltage, okay? Because if you remember when we talked about what those potentials are, they are actually huge electric fields. So if from minus, minus 60 you go to plus 10, 
it's it's a massive change of, of electric field. So it just pushes the it pushes the protein to change its conformation. Okay, because there are charged residues, charged amino acid residues, which move along uh, when when the voltage changes. Okay, now, so we we increased calcium in the um, in the cytoplasm, and obviously in the end. We also need to decrease it back again, otherwise the muscle once contracted would have to contract forever. So we need to decrease the, the, the calcium or remove the calcium that we, uh, that we allow to enter the cytoplasm. For that, the major protein that does it is a pump, a calcium pump, which is on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which uses ATP, so it's, AT, which it's an ATPase, so it's ATP to pump calcium back in uh, into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There is obviously a higher concentration of calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum than it is in the cytoplasm, so we need to use ATP hydrolysis to, to power this process. Okay? So it's an ATPase that pumps calcium. The name of this, of this pump is CIRCA, which stands for Smooth Endoplasmic Reticulum Calcium Pump. Okay? CIRCA. There are also some pumps and antiporters on the, on the cell membrane which will also pump some of the calcium out, but they are less important for skeletal muscle. The most important one is, is CIRCA. Okay, so this is how we increase calcium. Now, so now we know how we increase calcium in skeletal muscle and we know what happens, how the whole contraction cycle works. But we need a connection between those two. What is the sensor? How do, how, how do, how do the, the myofibrils know that there is an increased level of calcium in the cytoplasm? In the skeletal muscle, this sensor is the troponin-tropomyosin complex. Troponin-tropomyosin complex. It is a complex, so it's composed of various subunits. One of them is tropomyosin. Now, tropomyosin is a relatively long molecule, long protein molecule. This is F-actin, okay? As you know, it's a dimer. There are two fibers. So this is F-actin. And tropomyosin, as I said, is quite a long protein molecule that sits at regular interval, intervals on this F-actin. And tropomyosin blocks the binding sites for myosin to actin. Remember, in the cycle, we saw that in order for the, for the movement to happen, myosin has to bind to actin, and then things start happening. Yeah? Remember that? Yeah? Everybody remembers that? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, now, under normal conditions, under conditions where calcium is very low, tropomyosin blocks those binding sites. So myosin, even though it's in the high energy conformation, it cannot bind to actin because those binding sites are blocked by tropomyosin. Now, to tropomyosin, the three subunits of troponin are connected. which are the actual sensors for calcium. There are three subunits of the troponin complex. They're called well, TNC, TNI, and TNT. So troponin C, troponin I, and troponin T, three subunits. Troponin C is the one that actually binds calcium. So when calcium concentration goes up in the cytoplasm, Calcium binds to troponin C, which changes its conformation. The conformation change is then transferred to the rest of troponins and is also transferred to tropomyosin, which moves away from its position and allows myosin to bind to actin. Okay, do you want me to repeat it? Raise it. Okay. So, we talked about how calcium concentration goes up in skeletal muscle. We know the whole sequence. Now when that happens, this increased amount of calcium binds, at least some of it, binds to troponin C. 
as troponin C binds calcium, it changes its conformation. And since it is part of this whole complex, the change of conformation in troponin C is transferred to the, to the rest of the complex, to the other two troponins and tropomyosin. And tropomyosin is moved away from its position so that the binding sites on actin for myosin are free and myosin can bind to it. Okay, so the increasing concentration of calcium from nanomolar, let's say, or 10 nanomolar to micromolar unblocks the binding sites on actin so that myosin, which already has ATP bound, can bind and can, can start the whole, uh, the whole cycle. Obviously, at the end of the contraction, when acetylcholine is removed by acetylcholine esterase, which stops the influx of sodium ions, the membrane repolarizes. I don't want to go into details how, but it repolarizes. The calcium concentration, all the calcium channels close. Calcium is pumped back in. The concentration of calcium drops. Therefore, troponin C releases its calcium because the concentration outside of it is low. And the whole thing goes back and troponin once again blocks those binding sites and the muscle relaxes. Okay, I can see that you desperately want a break. Um, so, if there are no acute questions about this thing, let's have a five minute break and we'll continue after that. Any questions? Ryanodine, R Y A N O D A I N E. Any questions about the contraction cycle or the regulation of skeletal muscle? Yep. What the what stands for? Oh, circa, smooth endoplasmic reticulum calcium pump. Well, there's no pump, but calcium, let's say, okay? Smooth endoplasmic reticulum calcium pump. <laughs> Any other question? Okay, so if you understand the, the regulation in skeletal muscle, it's very similar for the cardiac muscle. Okay, so we'll build on this, and I'll just mention the differences between cardiac muscle and smooth, uh, uh, the cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. Now, you know the differences in uh, structure. You know that while skeletal muscle has very long fibers that are basically fused cells together, in cardiac muscle there are individual cells that are connected by gap junctions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm not going to go into, into that. The main difference between the uh, the well, there, there are several differences. One is we don't have, as you know, the, the cardiac rhythm, cardiac contraction, cardiac muscle contraction, is not regulated by nerves. Okay, how is it, how is it regulated? What is, what is the stimulus for contraction in the heart? Okay, so there's a spontaneous depolarization in specialized bits of cardiac muscle. Okay, the SA node, the AV node, okay, depending, normally it's the SA node, which is not important now. The important thing is there is an automatic depolarization that happens in the, in the muscle itself. Okay, so it's not, it's not driven by nerves, unlike skeletal muscle, it's done in the muscle itself. There are specialized cells for that. Yep? Can it be driven by nerves? No, not really. Okay. It can be regulated by nerves, so it can be slowed down or speeded up, but it can't be driven. Okay? Okay, so there is a, there is a, a pacemaker specialized muscle cells in the, uh, uh, in the muscle itself. And the depolarization travels through the, through the whole muscle because as we said, they're connected by gap junctions. So the depolarization can move through the individual cells and, and stimulate the other one. And there's the conductive system, which is not that important now. Okay, looking at the cellular level, the main difference between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is that in skeletal muscle, we said that we do not need any extracellular calcium, okay? We only need a sensor on the cell membrane, which tells us the cell membrane is depolarized, which is then transferred to the, uh, to the sarco sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium is released. 
in the cardiac muscle, we do need outside calcium. So what we see in the membrane of the cardiac muscle of a cardiac muscle cell, so this is a cell membrane. There's also a dihydropyridine receptor, different type. So there's a voltage-gated calcium channel, which allows some calcium to go in when the membrane is depolarized. Okay. During, the, um, during the, the break, I had a question whether dihydropyridine receptors are voltage-dependent calcium channels. Yes, they are indeed. Okay. They are a type of voltage-dependent calcium channels. So that's another name for it. There are many, many different types. Okay. So in the cardiac muscle, we have another type of dihydropyridine receptor. They're also blocked by dihydropyridines, but a slightly different one, which allows calcium to go in. And then we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which contains also a ryanodine receptor, but a different one, which is stimulated. So those two are not physically connected in the cardiac muscle. But this ryanodine receptor is stimulated by the calcium that goes in through the dihydropyridine receptor. So we have a DHP receptor, we have a ryanodine receptor which looks exactly the same way, well, the, the arrangement looks similar to skeletal muscle. But in skeletal muscle, the two are physically connected and the depolarization of the membrane and the conformation change in the dihydropyridine receptor is directly transferred onto the ryanodine receptor. In the cardiac muscle, the thing that opens the ryanodine receptor is the calcium that goes in from the outside. It's a tiny little bit of, just a moment, it's a tiny little bit of calcium, they call it calcium sparks, so we just need a few ions of calcium to go in, which then open ryanodine receptor and massive amount of calcium goes out. Okay? A very important difference between the two. So we said that we don't need any outside calcium for skeletal muscle, but we do need at least a little bit, it's a tiny little bit, but it's very, very important uh, of outside calcium for the, uh, for the contraction cardiac muscle. Yep? I don't think it is faster. It's probably slower, if, not, if anything. I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's a huge difference between, uh, between the two. But the important thing is that changes in extracellular calcium will really affect cardiac muscle contraction, but not skeletal muscle contraction. Yep? Uh, but if the hydro DHP is still voltage regulated? Or oh, uh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. This, this is also a voltage gated, a voltage dependent calcium channel. Okay? Just a slightly different kind than here. Okay? But otherwise it works the same way. But here we actually need the calcium that goes through. Here we don't. We just need the, the change in conformation. Okay? So for cardiac muscle contraction, almost, almost all the calcium, most of the calcium also comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But in order to release it, we need a little bit of calcium from the outside. Okay? Now, I said that dihydropyridine receptors, those voltage-dependent calcium channels that we talk about, are named dihydropyridine receptors because there's a class of drugs that are dihydropyridines that bind to them, okay? <laughs> those drugs, or the class of drugs, are called calcium channel blockers, obviously, because they block calcium channels, and they are used to treat hypertension, high blood pressure. At least part of the effect of calcium channel blockers is here. Okay, because if we decrease the amount of calcium that goes into the heart, we decrease the strength of contraction of cardiac muscle. And if the heart basically contracts with less strength, it pushes less blood into the bloodstream and therefore decreases blood pressure. Yeah, okay, this is extremely simplified because they also affect the, the rhythm, etc., etc. So I don't want to go into, into too much detail. But Dihydropyridines have no effect on skeletal muscle. Okay? They bind to the receptor, but that doesn't matter because we don't need the calcium that goes through. Okay? So skeletal muscle, no effect. In cardiac muscle, there is indeed an effect. Okay? Because the dihydropyridines and other calcium channel blockers can block the calcium that goes in that is important for the initiation of <coughs> contraction. Does this make sense? Yeah, good. 
Now, after we've increased calcium in the, uh, in the cytoplasm of cardiac muscle, the rest of the process is the same as in skeletal muscle. So in cardiac muscle, therefore in all striated muscle, we have the troponin tropomyosin complex, which is the sensor for calcium. Okay, so it works the same way. Calcium binds to troponin C, the conformation change is transferred to troponin T, troponin I, and tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is removed from the, uh, from, from the blocking position and myosin can bind. Okay, the rest of it is the same. What I'll mention here is that the troponins in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are different subtypes of troponins. So if, if, if there's a damage to cardiac muscle, those troponins are released and we can specifically detect whether they are cardiac muscle troponins or whether they are skeletal muscle troponins. And this is used for the, the diagnosis of, uh, of myocardial infarction, of heart attack. Because when you have a heart attack, some, a, a little piece of the muscle dies and those troponins are released into the bloodstream. So we can detect specifically cardiac type troponins uh, and it's used in, in diagnosing a heart attack. Okay, which will be important in later years. Right, any questions about cardiac muscle uh, contraction? Yep. Uh, I didn't understand the difference between um, because both of them are dependent on calcium. Yep. But why is, is uh, cardiac muscle less dependent on that? No, uh, skeletal muscle is not dependent on outside calcium. All the calcium it needs is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The cardiac muscle, we do need some calcium to go in from the outside. Okay? Yeah, in the contracting cells, the action potential, the action uses calcium, doesn't it? The action potential. Yes, it, it does. Yeah. Is that from the DHP? There are also other types of, of calcium channels. Okay, some of it goes, some of it comes from here, but there are other kinds as well. And I don't want to go into the regulation of the rhythm because it's they, it's a fairly complicated thing. Can they trigger the? Uh, the other name or? Um, usually, those two types of channels are very closely associated, so they're not physically connected in, as in skeletal muscle, but they're very very close to each other. So. Uh, the other types of channels, they may be at a, at a different part of the cell where they're not connected with, where they're not in close association. So the calcium that goes in, as you know, directly in the, in, not just in the conductive system, actually, the whole action potential is driven at least in part. Now, I'm talking about things that you'll hear a lot more about next year. So, okay, and this is slightly more advanced that we're talking about now. So this calcium could probably activate it because it just, it just needs to bind to that. But since they're not very close to each other. It takes a long time for the calcium to diffuse there, so it probably doesn't affect it hugely. Okay, but in theory, it could. Okay. Yep. The deep, this is like, doesn't it need to be depolarized? Oh, absolutely. I left that part out, out completely because I said there is depolarization from the from the pacemaker, which travels along the um, um, uh, 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 along the whole cardiac muscle. Of course, there is depolarization is the first step. Okay, and since this is a voltage-dependent calcium channel, it needs to be depolarized in order to open. So absolutely, depolarization is the first step. Okay. But does it in the cardiac muscle and depolarize the cell? Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. No, the cardiac muscle has specialized pacemaker cells that depolarize themselves, and then the depolarization spreads around the muscle. Okay. Yep. Yep. But, yeah. And it's not, uh, it's not just different types of um, pumps, it's a troponin. It's a troponin, correct. Okay, so when the muscle dies, all of its proteins are released into the bloodstream. And we just pick the ones that we know are specific. Okay, there is lactate dehydrogenase, lots of enzymes, so you can detect all sorts of things in the bloodstream. But we picked troponin because we know that it's cardiac specific, and we can say this is this only comes from damaged cardiac muscle. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, how, the, how does the heart regulate the, the heartbeat? Like how okay, the that's heartbeat? not the subject of today's lecture. Okay, that's there will be another lecture about that next year. Okay. <coughs> it's quite interesting, but you'll hear about it later. Okay, any questions about cardiac muscle or skeletal muscle? 
If not, we'll move on to the last type of muscle, which is smooth muscle. Now, smooth muscle is very different from the two types of striated muscle. Okay, you know that there are individual cells that are not connected by gap junctions. They, are, they look like normal cells. They, they can contract. They don't have any specialized T tubules. They don't have as much sarcoplasmic reticulum. They're just very different from the, from the rest of it. And the mechanism of contraction or the regulation of it is also very different. We said that for all three types of muscles, calcium is the main uh, stimulus. And it's, it's true also for smooth muscle. Uh, only there are different ways for smooth muscle to increase its intracellular calcium concentration. One of it, one of the types, could be depolarization, membrane depolarization by a nerve or by some neurotransmitter or something like that. So that's similar between, between the two. But in smooth muscle, there is another way where a hormone can release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So a hormone can bind to, it, to, to a receptor. It doesn't depolarize the membrane, but through a signaling cascade, it can release calcium from the, from the intracellular stores. I'm not going to go into too much detail because you'll hear about the different signaling cascades that can do that in the next course. So we'll hear plenty about that. I'm just saying now that unlike skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, which need to be depolarized, their membranes need to be depolarized in order for contraction to happen, in smooth muscle, that's not the only possibility. Okay? So smooth muscle can contract even without depolarization. Now, the other very important difference uh, between skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle is that smooth muscle depends much more on extracellular calcium than either of those two. Okay? So once again, skeletal muscle doesn't need extracellular calcium, sort of. Cardiac muscle needs extracellular calcium, but only needs a little bit of it. Smooth muscle is, out of those three types, the most dependent on extracellular calcium. Okay? So smooth muscle won't actually contract for very long if you don't have, if you don't have calcium outside. Okay, it probably won't contract at all, just very, very briefly. Okay? So smooth muscle is extremely dependent on extracellular calcium. Going back to our story about dihydropyridines and calcium channel blockers, I said that they're used to treat hypertension and that one part of their effect is due to slowing down the heart and making the contraction less strong. But the main part of their effect is actually not in the heart, but it's in the smooth muscles. It's in the smooth muscles of arteries and veins, and smooth muscles of blood vessels. Since smooth muscles are very, very dependent on extracellular calcium, if we block the calcium channels that are, that are, um, uh, that are on the membrane, we, we release the contraction of smooth muscles. And if we release the contraction of smooth muscles in blood vessels, the blood vessel, becomes, the blood vessel uh, cross section becomes larger, and therefore the blood pressure drops, because there's more space for the blood to be in. Okay? So the main part of the effect of calcium channel blockers is not in the heart, at least for most of them, but it's actually in the blood vessels. Okay? So smooth muscle of blood vessels is the main target for calcium channel blockers. And the reason is that smooth muscle, unlike the other ones, needs a lot of extracellular calcium to actually keep up with the, um, with the contraction. Okay? The contraction in smooth muscle is also much longer. Okay? In, in cardiac muscle or in... Or in um, skeletal muscle, the actual contraction tends to be quite short and it tends to be quite quick. For smooth muscle, the contraction takes a long time to develop and a long time to stop. So the contraction generally in smooth muscle is much, much longer. Okay? It's also a different kind of regulation because as we said, they can be regulated by, uh, by hormones, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, let's get to the main difference between smooth muscle and striated muscle. Smooth muscle does not have troponin, tropomyosin complex. Okay? So we need a different kind of calcium sensor. It's not troponin, tropomyosin. We need a different kind of calcium sensor. Now, in smooth muscle, the sensor for calcium is an enzyme. It's a kinase, which is called myosin light chain kinase. Myosin light chain kinase. As the name suggests, it's a kinase that phosphorylates the light chains on myosin. Okay? So, so far, we haven't really talked about the light chains. We're just interested in heavy chain that actually does all the, all the interesting stuff. 
But I said very briefly in the beginning that light chains are important for the regulation of contraction. They are probably quite important for the regulation of contraction in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle as well, but there is very little known about them. So they do play a role, but we don't really know what kind of role and how important they are. In the smooth muscle, the phosphorylation of light chains, of the regulatory light chains by myosin light chain kinase, is the thing that allows the whole contraction of smooth muscle. Okay? So when calcium increases inside a smooth muscle cell, it binds to a protein called calmodulin. Raise your hand if you've heard of calmodulin. Okay, not that many people. So calmodulin is a specialized protein in the cell that binds calcium with high affinity. Uh, troponin C, which is the, the binding protein in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, is quite similar to, to calmodulin. There are different proteins, but they work in a, in a, in a similar way. Okay? So calmodulin just floats around the cytoplasm, and when the concentration of calcium goes up, it binds calcium. And this whole complex of calcium calmodulin binds to myosin light chain kinase and activates it. Now, once we have myosin light chain kinase activated, it goes to myosin and phosphorylates, using ATP obviously, it phosphorylates the light chain. Once the light chain is phosphorylated, the myosin with bound ATP or other ADP and phosphate can bind to actin and the whole cycle can start. Okay, so for skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, in the, in the contraction cycle, we stopped before binding of myosin to actin, right? And we needed for troponin and tropomyosin to move away so that, actin, so that myosin can bind, right? This is what we said for, for those two things. In the smooth muscle, there is no troponin tropomyosin. But the myosin cannot bind to actin unless its light chain is phosphorylated. So it just sits there with the ADP and phosphate bound to it, and it can't bind. But when myosin light chain kinase is activated by calcium calmodulin, it phosphorylates the light chain, and then the myosin can bind to actin and cause the contraction. Yeah? What is the inhibitor? Like what stops it from binding? Well, the conformation of the protein. So unless it's phosphorylated, the light chain, unless it's phosphorylated, the myosin does not have the right structure to bind with high affinity to actin. Only once it's phosphorylated, it changes its conformation, then it then can bind. So the regulation here is not at the level of, the, of actin. The regulation here is the level of myosin. Myosin cannot bind unless it's phosphorylated. Does that make sense? It's a fundamental difference between, the two, between smooth muscle and striated muscle. Yep. You said that there are several ways to stimulate uh, calcium. Yep. To get in that smooth uh, Yep. You said one hormone. Yep. All of the other. Depolarization, the same way as in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So you can depolarize, or you can use a hormone that doesn't depolarize it, but also releases yeah, calcium. Hormones are more important, more important, it depends which smooth muscle we're talking about. Okay, do, do, does it make sense? Do, do, do you see the main difference? Do you understand how Mars and light chain? Because in tests, this is very often we see that students are confused and they still think there's some troponin there and stuff like that. So this is quite an important thing to see the difference. So no troponin and it's calcium modulin. To Cal modulin. I'll just write it down. Say again, the question. No, 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 no. Calmodulin binds calcium, then the whole complex binds to myosin light chain kinase, and that's the enzyme that phosphorylates myosin. So this is what phosphorylates myosin, but it needs this in order to be activated. I'm just going to write down calmodulin. Calmodulin. Okay, I'm, I have a feeling that it's not entirely clear, but, well, now, now is your chance to say, you know, explain it again. Could you just explain again? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, calcium increases, we're talking about smooth muscle now. Calcium goes up, and since there's, in the cytoplasm, there is a protein called calmodulin floating around, floating around that has high, high affinity for calcium, it binds calcium. It forms a calmodulin calcium complex. It still flows around, okay? When it comes close to myosin light chain kinase, which is inactive, 
it binds to it, they form a complex. So we have a complex of myosin light chain kinase, calmodulin, and calcium. And this complex becomes active, becomes an active kinase, which then phosphorylates myosin light chain. Once the myosin light chain on, on the myosin molecule is phosphorylated, it can bind to actin and start the whole cycle. The whole cycle will keep going, so the contraction will keep going, until the phosphorylation, the phosphate group which was added to the myosin light chain is removed. And there's indeed a specific phos phosphatase, MLCP, myosin light chain phosphatase, which removes the phosphate group and therefore stops the whole thing. So once again, myosin cannot bind to actin. Yes? Does different vasodilators affect the signal cascade or is it always just the blocking of calcium? It's not always just the blocking of calcium. Yes, you can influence it in different ways. Okay, you'll hear about it later. Uh, so the increase in calcium substrate binds the calcium Yeah. which binds to the myosin light chain kinase on the body of the head of the myosin. No, the myosin light chain kinase is just floating around. Uh, it's not associated with myosin. Oh, that's right. And then, so, but that is what de phosphorylates the light chain. Correct. Which then activates its like, stick to the... Correct. Yeah. Does the smooth muscle have the sacroplasmic reticulum? It does. It, do, it does, indeed. There is smooth, there's both smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, but it's not in in such striking structures as in, as in, for example, in the skeletal muscle, so you don't have the huge cisterns and it's not associated with T-tubules, but there's definitely smooth endoplasmic reticulum and it's, it, it is an important source of calcium as well. Yeah. Okay? Well, depends on the specific type of muscle. It doesn't have to be most of it coming from the outside, but it's definitely a lot more coming from the outside than in the other two types. Okay? So saying that it's mostly from the outside, mostly from the inside, it's quite hard for smooth muscle because it's a combination of both. But unlike, unlike skeletal muscle, which needs none, and cardiac muscle, which needs just those calcium sparks a little bit, smooth muscle is really dependent on, on, on the calcium coming from the outside. Okay? Is it clear now? Yep. And does the contraction stop when uh, it is phosphorylated? Correct. Yeah, and it stops when it's a default for a later. Correct. MLCK, is that close to the sarcomere, or is it part like where is it floating? It's floating freely in cytosol or closer to cytosol? You, you, you'd think, well, it, it's somewhere in the cytosol. You'd think that it's probably closely associated with the, uh, with the myofibrils, you, probably, but oh. yeah. That's, yeah, you'd think so. I, I, I don't know, yeah. Uh, after the phosphorylation, we need to remove calcium. Do we do it in the same way as the other two? Yes. Um, obviously, when the, when the stimulus, the hormone or depolarization goes away, we also have to pump the calcium away from the cytoplasm in order to stop the, this whole cycle. And it works in a similar way as for the other types of muscles. So some of it is pumped back into the, sarcoplasmic into the endoplasmic reticulum, some of it is going to be pumped into the mitochondrion, and some of it is going to be pumped out of the cell using antiporters or, or pumps. So correct. In order to stop the contraction, we have to remove calcium. Okay? Yep. Does calcium does anything to do? Nope. No, it doesn't. Okay, yeah? The regulation. So in, in the cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle, the regulation sits on actin. It's the troponin tropomyosin complex. Okay? In the smooth muscle, the regulation is at the level of the myosin head, which needs to be phosphorylated in order to bind. So there's nothing on the actin blocking myosin to bind. It's, it's the conformation of myosin itself that doesn't allow it to bind. Okay? Okay. Right. The last bit I want to talk about is what are the substrates, what are the energy substrates for muscle? Where do we get the ATP from? Okay? Now, let's start with skeletal muscle because that's, at least by mass, that's the most amount of muscle that, that we have. Okay? Now, skeletal muscle, um, the, the, the substrates that will be used to produce ATP in skeletal muscle depends on the load on the muscle. How much, how, 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 what is the intensity of the exercise? So as you sit here and 
basically don't do anything physically, your muscles will mostly use fatty will, will mostly use fatty acids as the substrate. Okay, so they will slowly oxidize aerobically, they will oxidize fatty acids, and they will produce ATP for whatever is needed to keep your posture and move around a little bit. Okay? As you increase the load, as you increase the intensity of the exercise, the proportion between fatty acids and carbohydrates, mainly glucose, well, probably just glucose, will change so that glucose is used more and more. And as you get to 100% intensity, so your maximum load, your muscles, your skeletal muscle, will use 100% glucose. Okay? So the two main sources are fatty acids and glucose, and it depends on the intensity of the exercise, which one you're going to use. It also depends on the duration of exercise, which one will you, you will use, because as you, especially as you train, the longer the exercise, the more fatty acids you'll be able to burn. Okay? But that's a bit more complicated. Let's, let's think more uh, about the intensity. So high intensity means lots of glucose. Low intensity means lots of fatty acids are burned, okay? Or lots, well, obviously much less, but it's mostly fatty acids that are, that are being burned. Where is the glucose coming from? Glycogen. For glycogen, from glycogen. Glycogen is the main source of glucose for, uh, for ATP, for smooth muscle, uh, for skeletal muscle contraction, okay? There's some glucose coming from the outside, but most of it uh, comes from, the, uh, from glycogen. Where are the fatty acids coming from? Hmm? From, from adipose tissue, from, from fat, fat tissue, okay? There's lipolysis, fatty acids are released, and those free fatty acids are used um, for uh, the metabolism. Right, so those are the metabolic sources of ATP. But when we start, when the muscle starts contracting, the first thing it's going to use it's just, is just, the, sort, is, is just the, the store of ATP that is inside the muscle, okay? So always some concentration of ATP, in the muscle, and the first thing that the muscle will use for the, f for the very short period of time when it starts contracting is just that ATP that sits around. So it doesn't have to start producing ATP by some metabolic pathways, it can just use what is there. This, the, the amount of ATP in, in your average skeletal muscle only lasts for a few seconds of the contraction, okay? You'll see different, uh, different types, sometimes, sometimes people will say two seconds, five seconds, something like that, just very few seconds. Uh, where you can use only the ATP that is there. So none of the metabolic pathways need to be turned up or anything like that. After those few seconds are gone and your ATP is gone, you have to use some other source. But you still don't really rely on glycolysis or beta oxidation because there's another source of, another macroergic compound that is in the muscle, which is creatine phosphate. creatine phosphate. So creatine phosphate is formed from creatine by a reaction with ATP to form ADP and creatine phosphate. And this reaction is freely reversible. So we don't lose any energy, we don't lose any chemical potential by turning ATP into creatine phosphate or by taking creatine phosphate and turning it into ATP. Okay? So it's a freely reversible reaction where we can store some of the energy that is stored in ATP in the form of creatine phosphate. Once again, what makes creatine phosphate a macroergic compound is just that it's kept far away, the, the, the ratio between creatine and creatine phosphate is kept far away from the equilibrium. Same thing as for ATP, okay? So this is just a, a way for the cell to store a little bit more ATP than it normally would in the form of creatine phosphate, okay? And when ATP is needed, the reaction runs in the opposite direction and makes ATP for the contraction, okay? Creatine phosphate stores enough energy, enough high energy phosphate for about 20 seconds of contraction. Okay, so we start with two or five seconds on ATP, and then we have another 15 or maybe 20 seconds on creatine phosphate. After that, we need to start making ATP by some other way. That was a question. No? Okay. What is creatine? Uh, creatine is a small molecule 
that is composed from bits of three amino acids. And those amino acids, and I want you to know them, are arginine, glycine, and methionine. Okay, those are the three amino acids that to get put together, they form creatine. Now, creatine is not a peptide, okay? It's not actually composed of those three amino acids joined by a peptide bond. It's not a peptide, it's a small molecule. And I'll draw it for you so that I can show which, which bits come from where. So this is creatine. And those of you who know at least some structures of amino acids will notice that this bit is from arginine. Very good. This bit is from methionine. It comes from methionine. Methionine, the group at the end that is bound to the sulfur, if you remember what it looks like, this methionine is used very often, this methyl group, sorry, is used very often to, to add to other compounds. So when we need to add a methyl group, methionine is, is very often the source of the methyl group. Okay? Yeah, this is, this is the end of the, of the side chain of methionine. And this group can be made labile and can be added to other things, okay? So this methyl group comes from methionine. And the rest of it, which is this, comes from glycine. It's basically most of glycine, you just remove the amino group. Yeah? I just have a question about creatine phosphate. Does, um, you said that, I, I didn't catch it, but is creatine phosphate used as energy or created to ATP? Correct. You have to convert it to ATP in order to use it. So there is nothing using directly a hydrolysis of, of creatine phosphate or something like that. You have to convert it back to ATP to actually use it for anything. Okay? The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called creatine kinase. Creatine kinase which, because it phosphorylates creatine. And it's also an important marker of muscle damage because there are different isoenzymes in the skeletal muscle and in the cardiac muscle. So creatine kinase, the cardiac specific isoenzyme, was used for a long time as a specific marker of cardiac muscle damage. It's no longer used very much because there are more specific troponins are much more specific. Uh, but creatine kinase is a very, very important enzyme, an important marker. Okay? Right. Um, is creatine absorbed faster than glucose? Say again? Is creatinine absorbed faster than glucose? The From where? Like, if you take creatinine... Uh, okay, so like now you put together quite a few things. Okay, you put together creatine, creatinine, okay, different things, and creatine phosphate. First of all, Creatine phosphate is only inside cells. You can't absorb it from anywhere. It doesn't cross the membrane. So you only find it inside the muscle cell, creatine phosphate, okay? Creatine itself is synthesized in the cell, but you can take it in, in, your, in your diet. Normally you would get it from, from muscle tissue, meat, uh, but obviously you know that bodybuilders take, them, take large, large amounts of creatine, believing that it will increase their muscle mass, which seems doubtful. Uh, but there may be some tiny, tiny little effect, but, but the studies show that it, it doesn't really have a huge effect on, on an actual protein synthesis in the muscle. It does have an effect on muscle mass because it, as, you, as you load your muscle with creatine from the outside, it pulls water with it, so your muscles swell with the water, so they look bigger uh, and they weigh more, but, but there's actually no effect on muscle strength or anything like that. Uh, the, the final thing, I'm, I'm, I know I'm not really answering a question, I guess, but the final thing that you mentioned is creatinine. Creatinine is a breakdown product of creatine. So creatine, as it looks like this, and actually creatine phosphate looks like this. 
Okay, so this is creatine phosphate. There's the phosphate group on the nitrogen. Say again? No, just one of them. Okay. Uh, so this is creatine phosphate. Both creatine and creatine phosphate are quite unstable, and they tend to form a cyclic compound. So the nitrogen binds to the carboxyl group and they form, form a cyclic thing. This cyclic thing is called creatinine. It cannot be turned back into creatine, so it has to be removed from, from the body. It has to be excreted. So that's a breakdown product of creatine. Why do I keep talking about it? Because it's also a very important clinical marker for the function of your kidneys. Okay? So the concentration of creatinine in the blood and in the urine is used to measure how well your kidneys work. How does, how does that work? Well, creatinine, given, given your mass of muscle, is produced at a constant rate. Okay? So if you have, I don't know, 30 kilos of muscle or something like that in your body, you will produce a set amount of creatinine no matter what, no matter how much, well, it's not quite true. If you exercise a lot, you'll pr produce a lot, but uh, you, you'll produce more. But mostly, it just keeps being produced at a constant rate. Okay? Now, if your kidneys work well enough, they will keep excreting creatinine at a constant rate as well, and your blood level will remain constant. Does it make sense? There's a constant rate of production, constant rate of excretion, and therefore, the concentration in the blood will remain constant. Now, if your kidneys start malfunctioning, if they're unable to excrete all creatinine, the creatinine level, the creatinine uh, concentration in, in the plasma will go up, which is usually a sign of the kidneys working less well than they should. Okay? So creatinine in, the clinical, in clinical medicine is not used to detect any damage of the muscle or anything like that, even though it is produced in the muscle. It's used to detect damage to kidneys because under normal conditions, it's produced at a constant rate and excreted at a constant rate. When something happens, you can see changes in creatinine levels in the blood. Yep? So, let's say you have malfunctioning kidneys. Will creatinine have a bad effect on your kidneys? If you're not really. No, not, not especially. Uh, it would probably have to go up a lot, but, but it, it doesn't really. It's just a marker of that the kidneys are not working well. Okay, do you have any questions? Yeah? The marker for kidney damage is lower blood pressure more. Say again. That so less creatinine? Yeah, so therefore your blood, blood level goes up. Okay? Creatinine accumulates, which shows that your kidneys are not working well. Okay? Urea is actually not a very good sign of that. It's not a good marker of kidney damage, but that, that would be going too, too far in the, in the clinical part. Do you have any questions about this, this whole lecture? Anything that wasn't quite clear? Yeah? Yes, there are different isoenzymes. There, there's a different isoenzyme in skeletal muscle of creatine kinase, and there's a different isoenzyme in cardiac muscle. So they can be distinguished. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, I saw in a sample test uh, there was a statement about uh, whether glucose 6-phosphate was present in the muscle. Mm -hmm. Is that something we need to learn? Or is it just unimportant? What do you think? Is glucose 6-phosphate yeah. present? Why, why, do you th why do you think it is? At least. Okay, so it can be produced from glycogenolysis through glucose 1 phosphate. And then? No. Okay, so just for normal glycolysis. I think the question in the test was about glucose 6 phosphatase rather than glucose 6 phosphate, which I'll leave to you to, to find out whether it's there or not. Okay? Any other question? Yeah? Sorry, I can't hear you. Yep. That's right. Correct. Correct. Okay. The question is about myosin light chain phosphatase. If we have a kinase that's, that allows the muscle to contract, we also need a phosphatase that will stop the contraction. Because if we don't stop it, if we, if we leave the light chains on, on the myosin phosphorylated, the contraction will just keep going forever and we'll just keep up using, uh, keep, keep using ATP and, and we can't stop it. The only way to stop it is to re remove the, the phosphate again, which is done by another enzyme, myosin light chain phosphatase, which, which is just constitutively active. It's, it's there all the time. So it just keeps removing the phosphate at a, at a constant rate. 
and we only change the, the rate of phosphorylation. So if we increase the rate of phosphorylation, muscle will contract. If we decrease it, uh, the muscle will stop contracting. There are two different enzymes. One is regulated by calcium, which is myosin lichen kinase. The other one is just active all the time, which is myosin lichen phosphatase. Okay, I know it's Friday afternoon. Okay, so have a good weekend.